You're watching the Etsy virtual event on boosting the impact of research and innovation through standardization. It's time now for our panel discussion on how we put Europe at the forefront of 6G research and innovation. And if you want to ask any of our panelists a question, then please do so now. Use the form here on the website to submit your question. As we continue to develop 5G, we are also looking ahead at what comes next. So how do we move forward? What role will Etsy play? And what is needed for Europe to take a leading position on research and innovation beyond 5G? Well, let's introduce our panelists, starting with David Boswarthik, Director of New Technologies at Etsy, Bernard Barani, Deputy Head of Unit in DG Connect with the European Commission. Mati Latva-Aho, Director of the Finland 6G Flagship Program at the University of Oul. Josep Maltrat of the 5G IA Software Networks Workgroup and also Telecom and Media Market Manager at Atos Research. Arturo Azcora of the 5G IA Vision and Societal Challenges Workgroup and also a director of India Networks, and Emmanuel Dotaro of ECSO, the European Cybersecurity Organization, and also technical director at TALIS. Hello, everyone. Thanks for taking part in our discussion today. We've got several representatives of the main actors involved in policy, innovation, research, and standards in Europe. So an opening question to get us all started. What can we learn from our experience in researching and building 5G as we move beyond 5G and begin researching candidate technologies for 6G? Is there anything we could possibly do better? Bernard, let me start by asking that question of you. Well, uh, thank you very much for the, for the questions. And um, I will try to take a perspective from the European Commission side, uh, taking as an example the funded research that we had for 5G over the last uh, seven years now, which have been running for seven years about, and the so-called 5G public-private partnership. I think in this partnership, uh, we have made uh, great things, and there are a lot of good things that have to be taken on board and that we can replicate for the future, uh, let's say, a research period that will cover 6G or beyond 5G type of uh, uh, technologies. And maybe the things that we could possibly um, improve compared to the last uh, period and to the last uh, funded program is the, first of all, the set of stakeholders. Uh, I believe uh, one industry which is coming very strongly into this uh, game and into this uh, into this type of uh, research ac actions is the microelectronics industry, which we did not have that much present in the previous, uh, let's say, uh, uh, program. And I believe these people would be uh, very key to be uh, associated with the program from the uh, onset, especially looking into how the microelectronics industry is influenced, is influenced or has a lot of impact uh, at the level of uh, standardization. But more, um, let's say more broadly, I would say the set of stakeholders probably has to be uh, also a little bit enlarged, taking into account that for the future, we want to look into complete value chains, not only about the networks, but also at the device level, IoT, or at the service level, uh, cloud computing. So we uh, believe for the next period, uh, it will be important to have, let's say, the really the right set of additional stakeholders that can make an impact, both from the technological side and from the standardization uh, side. We believe also what is very critical to address, which probably we did not have too much look at in the previous uh, period are the so-called societal on issues or non-functional properties. So that means all the issues which are related to uh, carbon footprint, acceptability of the technology uh, in general. We have seen a lot of resistance to 5G so far through the EMF, the electromagnetic radiation uh, story. Also people complaining about the uh, energy uh, footprint of this technology. So uh, we believe these societal issues will gain in importance and this needs to be tackled really with the right uh, the right approach and we need to look into the technologies for that from the onset and from the pure european perspective uh, i believe that uh, what we could do potentially a little bit better 
is the uh, link and the coordination with the initiatives that the member states uh, are launching. You know that uh, there are many things happening in the member states. Money is scarce, so we need to really make the best out of all the investments which are being uh, done in Europe and in European research and to try to have the, to maximize the synergistic effect across all these initiatives, what is uh, supported at EU side and what is supported at national side. And from that perspective, uh, here, I believe we could do better to maximize the impact of what we are, uh, what we are doing. So that would be my few uh, ideas to, let's say, improve or do better compared to what we have been doing so far. Thank you, Bernard. All very, very good points. Anybody else want to add any thoughts about um, what lessons we have learned and what we could possibly do better as we head towards 6G? If there's, if there's no takers, well, oh, Matty, please. Well, one, one thing that I think we have to do uh, better actually is, is to is to realize that actually the real business potential potential in in both 5G and 6G is in different vertical application areas and uh, in in those countries in the world which are agile enough and and somewhat let's say radical in deploying verticals to new areas of society will be really the winners so the key success here that that we should try to do better when moving towards 6G is to try to understand thoroughly enough what are really the barriers related to introduction of critical verticals then secondly, trying to remove those barriers through, for example, changes in, in, in regulation, which, by the way, are very different in each vertical area. And then thirdly, um, we also give an active support for development of new ecosystems and value chains. And, and in many times, all of this means really uh, serious changes in regulation in, in different fields. Thank you, Matty. And I'd like to, to um, ask you a follow-up question and stay with you for a moment. And that is, what kind of brand new characteristics, applications, use cases, or, or even new customers can we think of and conceive when moving towards 6G? Well, this is really a, a huge question, but let me try to give you a short answer. Um, if you start from the very beginning, I think the firstly, the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals should be the first and most important driver for 6G era, uh, besides, of course, verticals efficiency and, and different technology superiority targets. Then um, following UN SDGs, uh, uh, we will start to emphasize new areas like global connectivity beyond current coverage areas, which is particularly important in, in different remote areas and developing countries. But of course, there are also several specific areas in, in, in every country, every, every uh, area with severe coverage problems that we need to solve. Um, building coverage to developing countries and remote areas, it's extremely important in trying to close the digital divide and by doing all these efforts, there will be, let's say, new types of incentives and, and even applications that we need to look at. I think I already mentioned some things about the verticals and the importance of those. And, and um, that's secondly, one really, really important uh, uh, issue to be understood thoroughly and from the very beginning. And um, maybe in, in standards and regulation process, uh, uh, critical vertical players should have uh, uh, let's say a more uh, natural role for for where they are coming from. Then uh, for technical superiority, which is of course uh, uh, giving all the opportunities for 6G applications and 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 that time of the of the world. And um, 6G definitely targets at being even better than 5G uh, uh, within this well-known 5G triangle. Everything is bigger and better, and, and the current vision is to push the, for example, carrier frequencies towards terahertz range, uh, which enables uh, extremely large system bandwidth. And this, in turn, will enable, for example, centimeter, centimeter uh, level positioning, which will open totally new types of applications, including imaging and radar with communication signals. You can also think about going beyond terahertz range, which means visible light communications, 
which would be kind of natural uh, in modern days when we have a lot of LED-based lightning systems. Then probably uh, uh, from applications perspective, uh, a major development is beyond radio. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning driven applications will seriously change everything we have experienced so far in the world. And um, taking benefit of huge amount of real time data of various sorts in mobile networks and also the distributed nature of the network will open uh, uh, incredible amount of new mobile applications. So far, most of the applications are very much reactive requiring user intervention. But in the future, the applications and devices should really be proactive, offering us uh, intelligently different services depending on, on time and place. And um, mobile edge technology will play a key role here. But uh, uh, for the sake of efficiency of the system, devices also must be part of smart computing tasks. So this is the type of future we are thinking of. Thank you very much, Matty. Very comprehensive. Joseph, if I can move across to you, what opportunities or risks will new approaches such as Open RAN bring to innovation and standardization strategies? Now, is there a potential reality that 6G be simply a collection of open initiatives? Well, um, yes, um, it's true. I, I see some risk in the evolution of say, 6G standardizations, I would say, because I think that the starting point that we have today is completely different than what we had at the beginning with 5G. Let, let, me, let me elaborate this a little bit, because I would say that from a standardization viewpoint, we know that 5G has been a, a great success. Um, I, I, we must admit that we have got a quite... Uh, rapid, uh, fast de development of the specifications, right? And I think that um, we th this happened because everybody understood the benefits of uh, working collectively, collaboratively around the standardization efforts in, in 3GPP, from research, from the innovation, from the commercial deployment, and, and a way of creating an, e an ecosystem, because 5G is, is a, a game changer, right? However, uh, there are some indicators now that I would say that shall impact the, the evolution of this of, of way of working on some SDOs, uh, because the starting point is what I say is different. For example, if you take into account uh, some facts, um, there are some countries like uh, USA that are doing some protection actions against some vendors, Chinese vendors like Huawei or SETI. This is something that everybody knows. Or, or other countries like Australia, UK, doing some discrimination, even some mistrust in, in Europe. This is a geopolitic fact that is happening. And it's a commercial war that, that we have that will definitely impact on, this, on the standardization because there are some companies, giant companies, that could, could be a bit um, discouraged to, to reach some common agreements if I cannot enter in your market, right? So, and also consider other, other perspective. Look at the hyperscalers and the telcos. Sometimes um, they are friends, they are working together because they are using the services and sometimes are competing. And this is this concept of frenemies, right? And this will change and is changing the way of working together the stakeholders around about this because it's a, a great business. It's, it's like if you think a year ago about the COVID-19, uh, nobody would expect that. So we need to to expect the unexpected. Uh, and I see the risk of having certain, let's say, fragmentation or, or, or certain in some, if you look at geopolitical facts. And I, I'm not saying it's good or bad. And when you say, um, yeah, open open initiative, it's a collection at the end of open uh, specification initiatives and so on. The point here is that that can be a misalignment, right, between how the standardization work is done and how this open initiative, sometimes open source initiative uh, communities, these open source communities work. Um, because I, I've contributed several times to um, open source communities. And, and what I see uh, from my experience is that sometimes there are some specifications that some points are not totally clear. You are going to the implementation, the development of, of that. 
and and there are point for implementation or interpretation. And when someone thinks that is needed an, an extra parameter and an extra function, the community simply makes a fast decision, go for that and do the implementation. That's that's what is happening, how it works. And it, this is different. The decision procedure is different how it's happening in the standardization. Because in the in the OS communities, there is no this certification concept traditional around the telcos that we have come for, for many years, the equipment and so on. Instead, we have um, testing, um, hack fest, plug test. Uh, we check the compatibility of some APIs and so on. And, and that's it. And this is something that I've seen in uh, initiatives like uh, HCNFB, uh, with the, that is, we have an implementation as OSM and the umbrella. And you compare some points with ONAP and so on, and, and there are some divergences. And if you look at an open run or all run initiative, that is a bit hype, of course, as it was NFB, I would say, three more than three years ago. But this brings a great opportunity, no, no, no doubt about it. But we need to be careful here because the, the implication of uh, implementation in the US community, the standards, the specifications are broken because changes in the specification that needs to be amendment, no decertification, but testing. Then the full interoperability uh, promise and in the adoption could be no accomplished. So this is something that we need to to establish, and I think the opportunity here is to establish some mechanisms that help us to work together. Uh, some communities, open source communities, some research um, that there projects and, and roadmaps that exist, and, and the standardization process. And this needs to be put together better. As I think that that's the risk and, and the opportunity that we need to do. Thank you, Joseph. And as you say, challenges and opportunities often very closely aligned. Um, Emmanuel, can we move on to security? Because 5G is already business critical and 6G is going to be even more so. Can we think of new paradigms and approaches towards end-to-end -end security in the world of beyond 5G? Well, first of all, maybe I, I'm going to be a little bit less optimistic about the, your statement as that we that we reach business uh, grade uh, compliance uh, with, with 5G. Uh, cybersecurity is a never ending story. So we are even a, a moving target. Uh, we need to face the changes that we have with 5G and we are just at the beginning. So uh, we don't have uh, today all the 5G, all the technology deployed. So, so we will face again and we will continue to face changes and, and dis even disruptions uh, in the way we provide uh, cyber security to the systems uh, and the services. We, we have at least two main uh, two main changes with, with 5G and it, it will continue with 6G. Uh, the first one is you, you all discuss about verticals and verticals, part of it, uh, of those verticals are requiring a uh, mission critical grade of, of, the, of the usage of the, of the infrastructure of the services and so on. So it's not the same deal when you when you have to control nuclear power right or, or rail signaling or, or airports compared to your, your 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 usage of your smartphone at home so uh, the the requirements are, are, are then really different so business grade i don't know what it means by the way because this is not a standard term so we will have to define that to be part of the game we will have to define maybe some grades uh, that will be reachable as it will um, make aware the users of what they are using in terms of infrastructure and services so the main the first main change is of the usage because we we need to cover requirements which were not fully covered before and the second one which is a big one is is, a, is the introduction of new technologies and new architectures so uh, talking about virtualization softwareizations cloudifications and tomorrow ai almost everywhere uh, all those technologies have to be secured by themselves but the usage in the, the, in the infrastructure and the services raise a lot of, of questions. Just giving a, a focus on AI, for instance, if you bias the data or the integrity of the data, you can change the behavior of the system. So you, you cannot rely on this smart benefit of the, of the AI if you, if you're not securing all the process of the learning and so on with, with AI. So talking about also perimeters, we, we discuss most of the time of 5G usage or 6G usage for uh, based on public telco infrastructure, but a lot of 
applications will, will be based on 5G private or hybrid uh, architectures of, 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 the, of the technologies. And we should discuss, you, you mentioned end to end, uh, we will have to reconsider all the fragmentations, the, the authority perimeters, the liabilities that, that, that comes with that. So, in, a, in a just in one word, we need to we need to deal with a transformation of the cybersecurity, which has to follow all the transformation of the system. Each time you introduce a new technology in the system, you have to ask yourself the question: of What is impact to the cybersecurity? How can I use this technology for cybersecurity itself? And how, and how can I secure the technology in the system or the services? So, main message is uh, we, we need to do that. And the good news positive is that see, we are doing that. So uh, in a few years from now, or in a few months, sometimes you will have uh, virtualized security functions that will be able to be distributed in the system in a, in a dynamic way, as dynamic as the system is. Uh, you will orchestrate those functions. You will have dynamic assessment of your, uh, of your system of services. But all things I mentioned here are not on the market today, and they will they will have to be to come in the following years in order to, to match the requirements from, from um, that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, just to give me an insight about the because uh, Joseph uh, uh, talked about the uh, certification. So we need things in certifications, and we need to deal with a new picture in terms of complexity of the systems and dynamicity of the systems. There's two main axes that we uh, that are worked by the community in, in Europe, and in particular with the uh, Cyber PPP in XOAs, to work on composition. If you have a very small part of your system, which are, according to the common criteria, very highly high grade in terms of security, it doesn't mean anything if you are weak on the other side. So you, you really need to have an approach which is end-to-end. -end. And today, this is not existing. If you want to, to buy a, a service in the cloud from 5G, nothing tells you what you are buying actually in terms of grade of security. So you have confidence or not, or both for, for the provider, you may you may have part of the system which is certified or not. But uh, so what you are using globally as a service, you don't know. So we need to, to progress on that as there are a lot of room for standardizations, new framework, new methodologies uh, to deal with those new systems, both with the complexity, as I said, uh, and the, the hyper fragmentation of the system, with a lot of black boxes, with part of services that you don't know what is actually happening inside, and uh, also considering the dynamics of the system with a kind of quality of security, something which is equivalent to uh, to what we, we had with the Q quality of service, but applied to security, just to know what you're buying, just to know what you're using. And last but not least, uh, in order to do so, you need people which are professional of cyber security because it's a lot of work to follow every day all the vulnerabilities, all the risks, the new risks, all the what we call uh, the CTI, the cyber threat intelligence. And if you look at the 22 million of enterprises in Europe, you cannot have the skills and uh, the time to do so everywhere. So you, you really, really need to rely on pure players delivering those uh, cyber security services in order to integrate the overall picture. And it's also um, if you, just uh, maybe some example of what we, we, we need to do in terms of standardization. Today, if you want to just to say to your neighbor or to the country uh, which is beside you that you are attack, under attack with cyber security, there is very few standards just allowing to, descri to, to describe wh wh what is the attack and how you can react for the co co coordination of the what we call the response to incident, for instance. We need to progress on the standard. We need to progress on the standardizations for the interoperability between the various orchestrators that are involved end-to-end -end in the system and services in order to make it smart and, it, and in order to make it consistent. So that's that's my, my, my last point. I, I would just try want to push to for the a kind of operational security which, which relies on the common standards and frameworks. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. We're going to push on because we want to give plenty of time to answer our viewers' questions. Arturo, if I can come to you next, what do you see as the 6G key performance indicators and expected changes in system conception? Thank you very much. In respect to KPIs, what we are going to see is to push even further the very demanding KPIs that we had with 5G. The KPIs of 6G are not formally defined yet, but there is substantial agreement already around the number of figures uh, by academia, industry, and, and SMEs. So for the big data rate, we are uh, discussing an improvement of 50 times higher, going up to one terabit per second. 
for the experience data rate, we are now defining 10 times more, going up to one gigabit per second as the experience data rate. We want to push even further the spectrum efficiency, uh, passing from 30 bits per second per hertz up to 60. So this is duplicating the spectral efficiency. In the experience spectral efficiency, we want a 10 times more experience uh, spectral efficiency, which is a big challenge. We also need more bandwidth. So we have to pass from a bandwidth usable of one gigahertz to a hundred gigahertz, making use of the new bands and of the new technologies, which is a very big challenge. In traffic density, because we expect to move a lot forward on IoT and on cyber physical systems, we want to scale a hundred times more in traffic density from 10 megabits per second per uh, square meter to a thousand megabits per second, so one gigabit per second per square meter. The same happens with device density. We want to have a higher density in, in devices and we want to push this forward 10 times more going to uh, 10 million devices per square kilometer. This is really challenging as you are thinking. We also have higher demands in uh, time and latency. We need to reduce the end-to-end -end latency from a one millisecond, which is the current uh, GPA 5G goal, to 100 microseconds. So again, it's an improvement of 10 times, a tenfold improvement. And there is a new requirement that did not exist in 5G, which is requirements in delay jitter, which is the variability of the delay. So now we want a very, very stable delay. Not we only want a very low delay, we want it to be very stable. So we are targeting a one microsecond delay jitter, which is a new KPI that did not exist in, in 5G. Now, we also want to be very efficient in energy. Bernard also mentioned this when he said, uh, what can we do better in 6G in respect to 5G? So in 6G, we had, in 5G, sorry, we had uh, an improvement in, in energy efficiency, but um, now we have a much more ambitious goal, which is one terabit per second per joule. So we need, for each joule of energy, one terabit of data transmitted. So this is uh, extremely difficult compared with today's metrics, and we are going to improve in the whole system, in, in the beam of the radio, in the processing of the core, in, in processing of the protocols. So it's a total concept and system redesign and rethinking. Reliability also has to be improved tenfold. So now we need from 10 to the minus five packet loss to 10 to the minus six packet loss, and in mobility, in speed for the actual mobile systems, we have to go from 500 kilometers per hour, which allows very, very fast trains, to go to 1,000 kilometers per hour, which will allow us to have 6G in jets. So even if you're flying in a jet and there is a high altitude platform and the mobile speed between the jet and the high altitude platform, the relative speed is 1,000 kilometers per hour, the system should behave uh, correctly. There is a final KPI, which is somehow controversial yet, that has already been mentioned by Mati, which is the location precision. Now, in 5G, we had a location precision of one meter systems based. That has not been implemented yet and it's still uh, unclear whether it will be implemented. For 6G, it has been fixed currently a precision location of one centimeter system based, even indoors, so not satellite based like GPS or Galileo. So totally based on the 60 system, a precision location of one centimeter, even indoors. This, like I say, is how, somehow controversial yet because it's unclear why it's not been implemented in 5G, why it should be included in 6G. So this is an overall idea of KPIs. And what is the qualitative improvement of 5G? And with this, I finish. In, in 5G, to me, the qualitative difference was edge computing, the generalization of edge computing. 5G is a network that not only transports information, but processes information. So it's a whole ICT system altogether. And this is a qualitative difference. I think that the difference in Z is going to be the data. 6G will be 
a data system. It will be revolving around the curation of the data, gathering of the data, protecting the data, securing the data, making the data available when it's needed. So breaking the silos, but at the same time, in addition to breaking the silos, keeping data confidential and secure when it's needed. Everything will be revolving about the data and the data control. So we will need a totally new control plane, uh, totally redesigned to have a system revolving around the concept of data. This is, on my view, what's going to be the qualitative difference in 6G. Thank you, Otero. Some ambitious KPIs there for us all to consider and, and think hard about. Bernard, if I can return to you, we've already touched on, on geopolitics earlier in the panel, but with, with Asia and the US already making big announcements about 6G innovation platforms, what concrete actions are needed to put Europe centre stage for 6G innovation? So, first of all, taking into account the uh, 5G situation that we experience today in Europe, uh, on one hand, there should be no complacency, but I don't think that uh, we have to be shy. And I suppose Europe can be proud of uh, where we are now uh, in uh, 5G, even though in 5G also the US and Asia have uh, launched or had launched uh, very ambitious uh, initiatives. It's true that uh, if I look at the perspective uh, in Europe today, uh, the deployment level is not as ambitious as it is in China or in Asia or in the US. But from the perspective of uh, mastering the technology and having the supply side ecosystem, uh, Europe is still very much present on the, uh, on the global scene and uh, has a very, very strong assets and uh, very, very strong leadership, I would say, in these uh, technologies. So we, of course, have uh, to maintain that uh, in front also uh, of the uh, competition, which is emerging for, from the other regions, as it is the case at the beginning of each and every new uh, GN plus one G type of uh, initiative. Now, uh, what I believe is that uh, Europe will be uh, very strong uh, if we manage to leverage the assets that we have in connectivity to reconstruct uh, bits and pieces which are potentially missing here and there uh, when we compare the supply side situation with the uh, other regions. But we have a lot of opportunities and there are a lot of opportunities to be seized. And this is where uh, I believe we can make uh, Europe very strong. So. If you look at the terminal side, for instance, or the device side, it's clear that Europe is not a player in the smartphone business uh, uh, anymore. But uh, if we look at the potential which is coming through all the IoT applications, where you will have billions of different, different type of connected device, from cars, from robots, from cranes, from whatever you can think of, uh, here is the potential of a new segment of devices that Europe should um, take as an opportunity because it corresponds also to industrial segments where we have a lot of actors uh, coming in and it corresponds to what I said before, that means to bring into the game uh, the correct and the, the right set of stakeholders which will help us to make this uh, promise materialize. The same uh, on the cloud side. If we look at the cloud side, Europe is not uh, necessarily leading now in that particular uh, sphere or in that particular uh, system side. But uh, there are a lot of opportunities which are emerging with edge computing, with the possibility of bringing computation closer to the users, as was said uh, already before, which is opening uh, doors to uh, European actors. And we have already some initiatives uh, in, the in the research, in some research institutes in Europe, uh, very strongly developing solutions for mobile uh, edge computing. So there are a number of opportunities, and we really need to leverage this type of value chain opportunities, as we uh, call them uh, in the Commission jargon, uh, to uh, really seize the opportunities of 6G. And if we manage to put in place this type of overall value chain approach with all the good set of stakeholders, uh, including, of course, uh, the application that they can serve, I think Europe can play a very strong role in this uh, future type of uh, 6G systems. Thank you, Bernard. And that leads very nicely into our final question for now to David, who's been waiting very patiently there. Thank you, David. What ecosystem needs to be mobilized in order to ensure the effective acceleration of research into standards for 6G? 
Well, thank you for the question, Guy. Um, it's been mentioned several times in the workshop sessions today and yesterday that the key action really is to increase the interaction and exchange between standards experts, standards bodies, and research projects and researchers um, as soon as possible. And to do this, we need uh, support and direction from policymakers such as the European Commission and member state leads. Um, it, good work has begun. We've seen this with 5GIA in the session this morning. We've, we've started improving the situation, which was already quite good, but I think we can do more. Let's get the standards engineers involved more and more with the research projects, and let's get the researchers more and more aware of the value of standardization to their end results and also exchanging on touch points in between those two. Um, I think it's not an ecosystem that needs to be uh, energized. It needs to be remobilized uh, with some added, added energy. And I see a sort of a magic quadra of, of four things. The policymakers giving us the lead, and we've had a very good lead from Bernard and PS showing us what Europe is intending to do. But not only we can look at the national uh, member states and also outside of Europe, European continent as well. Give us a lead on what the priorities are and also that relates back into the funding. Very important, fund those priorities. Um, then the research community, EU research projects, uh, European uh, telecom platforms, private and public research bodies, universities and students coming up through those universities. Really uh, be energized on a single vision. Where do we want to go together? That's the important thing. Not reduplicating energies, not doing fractured, as I heard earlier in the session, fractured standards. Let's not do duplicated and fractured research. Let's make sure that we move on our strengths in the same direction. Very much so with the standards bodies, and I'd like to put Etsy uh, center stage there, of course, because they're who I work for, but not only. There's a number of standards body out there, and we need to make sure that the policymakers, the researchers, and the standards bodies are talking in a similar direction. And then throughout that, the global ICT industry, so all the operators, vendors, integrators, researchers, everybody who's involved, make sure that at all those levels, they're active and working in the same direction, that we're not trying to fracture standards and research, but we actually converge on priorities for Europe uh, to make us get there quicker. Um, Really, we need to share a single vision for putting Europe in a lead position for beyond 5G, 6G, whatever comes next. And then each of those players in that magic quadra uh, end, ends up with a role to perform and work with the others. Thank you very much, David. And thank you, everyone. We're going to stop our discussion here, but not for long, because we're going to return shortly to answer live questions from our audience. This is your opportunity to question our speakers. If you haven't already done so, then please use the form on the website to submit your questions now. And we'll get through as many of them as we can. So please stay with us and we'll be back with our final live Q&A session in just a moment. Goodbye for now.